Tenospondylus was first found in the Wichita group of Texas, and then the Cutler group of Arizona, and then finally in the Green Formation of Ohio. While this does seem like an odd range for an animal to have, it was all very closely compacted together in Pangaea over 270 million years ago, right along the equator when this animal lived. In fact, these equatorial regions, and at the same time, is when we find a lot of Tenospondylus's closest relatives, animals like Sphenacodon and also Dimetrodon, which, when you look at their sales, there does seem to be somewhat of a trend here, but before you jump onto the bandwagon of, oh, this is just one evolving into the next, there's a couple things that help to disprove that. For example, Dimetrodon specifically has both been found in the Cutler group in Arizona and the Wichita group in Texas, so they were definitely overlapping in time periods. And if you're also thinking that potentially it's just sexual dimorphism, and that Tenospondylus just had a smaller sale but was the same species, some people actually already looked at sexual dimorphism in Dimetrodon specifically, and found that with some species, there are some different features which suggest it may have been sexually dimorphic. And these are both very clearly not Tenospondylus. In fact, the two specimens on the screen now may be male and female, with one having a slightly shorter sail, and also one of them having thicker bones. But this helps to suggest that Tenospondylus was not just a male or female of Dimetrodon, which was already known. Instead, it helps to suggest that Tenospondylus was its own animal that was doing its own thing, although in a very similar environment, and potentially feeding in a lot of the same ways too, as we will get to. So what were these sails used for? Well, one idea has been species recognition. Essentially, they could tell themselves apart from one another. And this has been also suggested in some of the ceratopsians with their different frills. However, some recent research suggests that that wasn't the case and that the frills and ceratopsians were probably used for interspecies competition. And so it stands to reason that that could very well have been what caused the, both the separation of Tenospondylus and Dimetrodon, and also what the sails were used for. Under this idea, the common ancestor of Sphenacodon, Dimetrodon, and Tenospondylus would have had similar sails. However, different populations would then have essentially started to prefer very specific sail types and shapes. These then would have become so diverged from one another that they could no longer interbreed and would become their own genus. And this is something that we see even today in some animals that are very closely related, like certain types of quail, which do have head feathers and head plumes used for display, but they can be wildly, wildly differently shaped. But the longest standing idea has been temperature regulation. The idea that if the animal stood perpendicular to the sun's rays, it would then absorb more of those rays. And if it stood parallel to the sun's rays, the opposite would happen. Most of the sun's rays would go past the sail, and heat could radiate off of the sail, helping to cool the animal. However, there are a few problems with this idea. And the first is fairly obvious on the face of it, and that's that these sails are all different. With all these animals being so closely related, we would actually expect them to have fairly similar thermoregulatory needs. And so you would expect them to have very similar sail shapes as they want to radiate heat or absorb heat in the same ways. And that's not what we see. And it's important to remember, again, these animals did overlap with each other quite a bit. Even Sphenacodon and Tenospondylus overlapped, as did Sphenacodon and Dimetrodon, and Dimetrodon and Tenospondylus. These animals were all living in very similar environments and around the same time. And the other concern, other than just sail shape, is those environments. And that's because it was very equatorial and warm. So a large sail shouldn't be needed to absorb heat very often. And if it was radiating heat off, there were streams and other things they could do in order to cool down. In particular, Dimetrodon, the one of these animals with the largest sails, has been found mostly in fluvial systems, essentially stream beds. So it's not very likely that they were using these to radiate heat which means the idea that these were for display is probably our strongest bet, at least right now. And the final nail in the coffin for the thermoregulation idea is honestly us, some of their closest living relatives, along with every other mammal. And that's because Sphenacodon, Dimetrodon, and Tenospondylus are all closer related to us than they are to any reptile. So they very well may have been warm-blooded or at least starting to develop warm-bloodedness. Now, we don't want to commit to this idea too much, because there needs to be more research done on this idea, but it is important to keep in mind that these animals are closer related to any mammal than they are to any reptile. And that's really frustrating and sometimes confusing, because for a long time this group was actually called the mammal-like reptiles. But that's falling out of favor, and it's more correct to call them stem mammals. And the main reason we can actually tell this is one of the features in the skull that I've talked about before in some of my other What the Hell Is This videos. And that's that they only have one hole in the skull for muscle attachments. Essentially, their synapses is what the group is called. Just like we are, just like any other mammal is. 
whereas reptiles are diapsids, meaning they had two holes in the skull for attachments. And as for what these animals were doing in their environment, it was all probably pretty similar, as they all reached about the same size, about 10 feet, or a little over 9 meters, although Dimetrodon could get slightly larger with some species. And while Dimetrodon was slightly larger, it wasn't taking large prey, at least based on evidence coming from one part of Texas, where there's actually a nest of the amphibian Diplocalus. In fact, one of the Diplocalus fossils has essentially part of the skull missing. It was nipped out by a predator, and the only predator of that size that's known from this formation is Dimetrodon, so it is a fairly safe bet to say that Dimetrodon probably did eat these animals. But the point is, they probably weren't feeding on very large prey. In fact, there were very few very large herbivores during this part of the Permian. So it makes more sense that they would have been very diversified in their diet, but mainly spread around small animals that lived during this time. So while Sphenacodon, Dimetrodon, and Tenosmundles were probably doing very similar things in feeding on small animals in the early Permian, it doesn't seem like there was one that was doing it particularly better than the others, in part because they all went extinct fairly early in the Permian. And then during the Middle Permian and Late Permian, the Therapsids were able to fill in this new apex predator niche that they had left empty. And those Therapsids included the direct ancestors to today's mammals. So without the extinction of animals like Tenospondylus, mammals probably wouldn't be here. And by extension, we wouldn't either. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Sorry for getting this out in May and not April like it was planned to. I was dealing with finals, so it took a while to get everything uh, organized and written. So you still will be getting another one of these later in the month, along with the um, month in review for April, which is currently being worked on. Don't forget, you can vote on these if you join our Patreon. That'll be linked down below. You essentially get four choices and you get to vote. With that in mind, everyone, be safe, take care, wear a mask, you still gotta do it and don't go extinct.